So good evening, folks. Mobile Gears are here once again with Friday Night Tech Talk. If this is your first time here, welcome. We do this every Friday night at 8 p.m. Eastern from the United States. And we talk about tech stories from the last week. Some stories that interest me or I think and hope might interest you. So I go over a few stories and uh, try to give you a few that maybe you haven't seen every place else. I do try to give you some of the top tech stories that other people might have and some that I think may be uh, not quite talked about as much. So uh, first one in here tonight was Brian. Brian's getting good at this kind of stuff. He was in here very early at uh, 641, so that's like almost an hour and a half ago. And then Eleanor was in here next, and she's wishing she'll be asleep. She's, she's got to work tomorrow, so she wishes everybody a fabulous weekend. So that's all that I know is in here, so if you uh, you want you can type something in the comments let us know you're here but meanwhile i'll show you the uh, tonight's stories every week i put them on my website so let me go share screen here and if we go to my website okay um it's at mobilegeezer.wordpress.com if you look at Today's date, just click on it. It'll pull up the stories just for tonight's show notes. So while we're here, we'll give you a little preview. And I just, this is one of those stories I just found interesting. Amazon offers individual developers free access to its AI coding assistant. And that was on The Verge. So I thought that was cool. But they're trying to beat out uh, Microsoft. Microsoft charges for the coding assistant, for the AI coding assistant. Now, that'll be the first story. And then I just ran into the story that uh, I didn't know that the former Twitter CEO is suing Twitter over some expenses, or some court expenses. So I thought that was an interesting story. And this, I, of course, is the big story of the week, I guess, for pretty much everybody. Uh, the the founder of Cash App, who was found murdered a, a few weeks ago, well, they actually arrested somebody for, for it yesterday, and everybody thought it might have been a homeless, but now he knew this guy, and this was another tech guy. So we're going to go into that a little bit. And just found that Google I.O. is going to be May 10th, so just wanted to get that out there. And then there's a story on digital trends that uh, iPhone 8, 8 Plus and iPhone 10 may have may not be getting any more software updates. And uh, the writer thinks that may be a good thing. So we'll go over that. And the last story, this is from Android Central, is the Note 7 still affecting Samsung's charging decision. So we'll go into that. So just wanted to let you guys uh, know what stories are coming up, and um, if you, if this is your first time here, please subscribe to the channel, and you'll see uh, the other videos. I, I usually put up two, maybe three videos other than the, the live uh, during the course of the week. So, and you can also keep up with me, a mobile geezer, on Twitter and uh, Facebook and Instagram. And I post a lot of my workout stuff here. Uh, most of you know I'm a really old guy. I'm 78 years old. I'm also somewhat of a workout junkie. I work out four or five times a week and um, probably pretty much in the best shape of my life for the last 20 years or so. So uh, let's see. Brian said, I wonder if the cash app guy ripped someone off and they came back for revenge well there was some speculation on i think tucker carlson's show last night about that so we'll uh, go into that so uh let's get on with the first thing of course 
far as I know, Mike is not going to be joining us tonight. With Will, I don't know. And with Ted, I don't know. Ted has been uh, coming on pretty regularly lately. He didn't come on last week. So if anybody, any of those guys come in, I will certainly let you know. So meanwhile, we'll start going into our stories. Go back to sharing screen. And we'll start with our first story. Amazon offers individual developers free access to its AI coding assistant. This was on The Verge. And I gather it's basically called Amazon Code Whisperer, and it has been a part of the Amazon Web Services. So let's go take a look. So Amazon offers free access to its AI coding assistant to undercut Microsoft. Amazon's Code Whisperer gener generates and suggests code, and now it's free for individual developers. That's by Emma Roth, and it's from yesterday. So let's go into Reader View and get rid of some of these ads. Amazon is making its AI-powered coding assistant free for individual developers, undercutting the $10 per month pricing of its Microsoft-made rival. In a post shared on Thursday, Amazon announced that its Code Whisperer tool is now available to everyone who signs up to use it. So I guess there's no criteria. You can just sign up. Amazon launched Code Whisperer as a preview last year, which developers can use with various integrated development environments, IDEs, like Visual Studio Code. I used to use Visual Studio when I was still programming uh, to generate lines of code based on a text-based prompt. While it was originally only made available to Amazon Web Services customers, the newly announced free tier should make it much more accessible to developers who don't use AWS. Because I'm sure there'll be a lot of people. Uh, code Whisperer automatically filters out any code suggestions that are potentially biased. That's pretty cool or unfair and flags any code that's similar to open source training data. So that's the nice thing about the AI. It goes and finds this stuff for you. Uh, it also comes with security scanning features that can identify vulnerabilities within a developer's code. That's very cool. While providing suggestions to help close any security gaps it uncovers. Now, of course, I realized because I was a programmer for 34 years, I'm probably a little more uh, excited about this, interested in it than most people, but I just figure it's good general knowledge to let people know. Uh, Code Whisperer now supports several languages. Yeah, it's a bunch of them that I used to work in, including Python, Java. I used to use Java, JavaScript. I used to uh, write in that. TypeScript, don't know it. Uh, C Sharp, I used to use that, including Go, Rust, PHP, Ruby, Kotlin, don't know it. C, C++, I used to use code in both of those, shell scripting, SQL, I used to do that too, and Scala. So I guess things haven't changed too much in the seven years since I retired from coding. Um, Microsoft-owned GitHub beat Amazon to the punch with its Copilot AI tool announced in June of last year. Although the coding assistant similar, similar, similarly generates and suggests code from within an IDE, Microsoft only made the tool free for students and developers working on popular open source projects requiring all others, and this is the key, to pay $10 a month for access or $100 a year. Google's DeepMind has its own alpha code tool as well, but it's still in testing. So I guess Google, you don't even have access to any AI tool yet. But this isn't the only AI-related news Amazon announced. It's also launching something called Bedrock. I keep thinking of the Flintstones every time I hear Bedrock, uh, which helps companies build and scale generative AI apps. It comes with a variety of fun foundational models that developers can build upon, including Anthropic's Claude, Stable Diffusion, never heard of either one, and Amazon Titan, that I've heard of. 
This should make it easier for third parties to create AI-powered tools that generate text, answer questions, create summaries, and more. So that's a very good thing. So just wanted to give you guys that bit of general knowledge. Anybody who does code, well, now you have another tool that you have access to for free. So let's go to this one. And let's see. Ryan said, what's your limits for fitness, a.k.a. a certain number of push-ups, pull-ups, lifting, a certain amount of weight, biking? And this. Well, Brian, basically, I do a lot of biking, as you guys, anybody who follows me on um, any Facebook, Twitter, or uh, Instagram knows that because I post all my results there. But I... Once in a while, I'll do some weights, and I do have a lot of them. I just don't use them much anymore. I stopped doing push-ups, pull-ups years ago, and I stopped worrying about how much weight I'm lifting or not lifting a long time ago. As long as I keep myself healthy, that's the main goal. And I find uh, biking, for me, is my favorite exercise, has been for the last seven or eight years, but it's also the best exercise I get because I usually do it for about an hour and a half to two to two and a half hours. So, uh, yeah, and Brian also said, looks like an interesting thing to tinker with. Yeah, the code whisper, yeah, it should be if it's nice and free, you can go out and try some code on it. That's what I would do. Uh, so let's go down to the next story. Like I said, I just found this. I didn't even know he was suing them, but former CEO, former Twitter CEO suing Twitter over unpaid legal expenses. Uh, and this was on Ars Technica. So let's go into that. Ex-Twitter CEO who was fired by Musk sues company over unpaid legal expenses. Uh, lawsuit Twitter refuses to reimburse costs related to federal investigations. That's by John Brodkin, and this was from Monday. So let's go into review, drop some of these ads. Uh, former Twitter CEO Parag Agrawal and two other ex executives sued the company today saying they haven't been reimbursed for over $1 million in expenses related to federal investigations and other legal matters. The lawsuit said former executives had to respond to investigations launched by the Securities and Exchange Commission and the Department of Justice and requested an expedited ruling requiring defendant Twitter to comply with its obligations to advance legal fees and expenses relating to an ongoing litigation and investigations. And I think I can see why Musk wouldn't want to have Twitter paying their court expenses, but I think all these expenses came from investigations by the federal agencies involved before Musk bought Twitter. So. I think to me, Musk is saying, this is on you, not on us. So that's my guess. Is that's why he's paying, not paying for it so far. But it'd be interesting to see who wins the fight or, over who pays these fees, though. Uh, Twitter has breached its obligations, they're saying, by refusing to advance plaintiff's expenses, according to the lawsuit, which was fired in filed in the Delaware Court of Chancery and reported by the New York Times. The plaintiffs have incurred significant expenses, including but not limited to attorney's fees and costs in connection with several proceedings, the lawsuit said. And again, to me, it's like it goes back to, did was Musk involved when these proceedings started or was he not involved? If he's not involved, I wouldn't want to pay it either. And I don't see why he should, but... Just my opinion. Uh, the lawsuit against Twitter was fired by Agrawal, former chief legal officer uh, Vijaya, Vijaya Gade, and former chief financial officer Neil Segal, all of whom were fired by current CEO Elon Musk right after he bought Twitter in October 22. And that's the key, October 22. Musk reportedly fired the executive executives for cause 
Yeah, well, I think nobody was doing much of anything at that point. In a possible attempt to avoid paying golden parachute deals, uh, an attorney for Agrawal, Gade, and Segal provided Twitter an invoice for legal expensive expenses, which reasonably evidenced that plaintiffs have incurred expenses in excess of a million dollars, all of which is required to be advanced to plaintiffs, uh, the lawsuit filed today said. So I guess from their side of it, they're saying since they were still working for Twitter when this started, Twitter is still responsible. So I can kind of see both sides of the argument. Uh, the lawsuit seeks an order requiring Twitter to advance all expenses the plaintiffs have incurred so far. Plaintiffs also want reimbursement for expenses incurred while suing Twitter to get reimbursement for the earlier expenses and an order declaring that plaintiffs are entitled to advancement of any future attorney. So they even, no matter how far in the future this goes, they want that paid for too and expenses incurred in connection with the proceedings. And this could be years, I think. Uh, Twitter's bylaws and agreements with executives require it to indemnify plaintiffs and advance all expenses incurred in connection with any proceeding in which plaintiffs are involved by reason of their corporate status, the lawsuit said. So I can see their point too. Uh, the bylaws say that Payments are to be made by Twitter in advance of the final disposition, Lord knows when that'll be, of each proceeding and would have to be repaid to Twitter if it turns out the executives aren't entitled to indemnification. So in other words, if Twitter pays this money out and then it's found out that they weren't entitled to it, they're going to give it back. Uh, do you believe that? I don't. Uh, Twitter refused to acknowledge obligations. When still working for Twitter, Agrawal and Segal were contacted by federal authorities about the SEC and DOJ inquiries, the lawsuit said. Agrawal wrote in a letter to Twitter on January 13th, that's this year, that I recently was contacted. Now, get this. I think this is a trying to be a threat to Musk. I recently was contacted by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission Division of Enforcement and the U.S. DOJ in connection with certain inquiries into the company and into Elon Musk. So I think they're just trying to throw a scare into them. That's my guess. Agrawal and Segal returned, retained counsel, provided testimony to the SEC in 2022, and their counsel have continued to engage with federal authorities, the complaint said. Additionally, Agrawal received requests before and after he left Twitter to take measures to preserve certain documents, that's reasonable, which likewise relate to his prior service as an officer of Twitter. Agawal, Gade, and Segal are all defendants in a securities class action filed in September against the company and its top executives on behalf of Twitter stock owners. So all of that is before uh, must even own the company. Uh, Gade also had expenses from being a defendant along with Twitter in different, in a different civil case and from being subpoenaed to testify at a congressional hearing on alleged social media bias. So if he's involved in a different civil case, is he trying to get them to pay for that too? I, I don't think it's clear. Um, despite timely written demand along with documentation from plaintiffs, through their counsel, the company has not advanced to the plaintiffs their expensive expenses actually and reasonably incurred related to the various proceedings. I, you wonder how many you know, are these various proceedings? Uh, the lawsuit said over two months after the plaintiff's initial written demand, the company offered only a cursory acknowledgement of receipt but still refused to acknowledge its obligations and to remit payment of any invoices. Uh, when Musk was trying to get out of his deal to buy Twitter, and I'm not going to go to, before he even, you know, he before he actually bought it, he tried to get out of the deal. So the SEC is still investigating him. So I just think there's room on both sides to uh, make a pretty valid point. So it's going to be interesting to see who, wins in this one, but I think it's going to be a very long fight is my guess. 
So I just thought that was an interesting story because I didn't even know about it. Uh, let's see. I wanted to stop screen. Okay. Um, any new comments? Um, Brian says, Elon trying to shave money wherever he can. Yes, he is, and, and well, he should. Uh, Renz is here. Glad to have you, Renz. Missed you very, very much last week. Don't make the old man worry. <laughs> so, glad you're here, brother. Um, okay, we're going to go on to our third story. Uh, no Will or Ted as yet. I assume Mike is working his DoorDash. I think that's what he pretty much does on Friday nights now after work. So let's go on to our next story, which I guess is, I think is the biggest story of the week easily. Okay. Tech consultant suspect arrest, arrested in cash app founder murder. And this was on CNBC because everybody had this story. So let's go take a look. And this was just, uh, yeah, just yesterday, yesterday morning, this arrest was made in, in uh, just south of San Francisco. Arrest made in stabbing death of Cash App founder Bob Lee. Men reportedly knew each other. Uh, published yesterday morning by Mackenzie Sigalos. So uh, let's get in read a view so that stuff won't keep popping up on me. Okay. In a press conference on Thursday afternoon, San Francisco District Attorney Brooke Jenkins confirmed that an arrest has been made in the April 4th fatal stabbing of Cash App founder Bob Lee. Officials named Nima Momeni, a tech entrepreneur in the Bay Area, as the suspect. Authorities also said that Momeni knew the victim though they would not comment on the motive. They also indicated that the investigating investigation was ongoing. Momeni will be arraigned on Friday, that was today, and prosecutors says they will be filing a motion to detain him without bail. Police made the arrest earlier on Thursday in Emeryville, California, a suburb 15 minutes outside of San Francisco. Now, get this. Jail records say that the 30-year-old Momeni was booked on suspicion of murder at 9.19 a.m. Oh, I shouldn't have said get this. But I think he had been uh, charged with a couple of other lesser things in the past. News of the arrest was first reported by Mission Local, a local San Francisco news publication. In the press conference, Jenkins criticized early comments from pundits and celebrities that used the murder to paint San Francisco as a crime-ridden and violent city. Yeah, they have a good point that it, we, we all, I think everybody assumed it had to be some homeless person, and it wasn't. So this wasn't that type of uh, crime, and I think they are right to uh, criticize those early comments. Uh, San Francisco police officers found Lee, 43, with stab wounds at 235. 5 a.m. in a deserted part of downtown San Francisco. He was taken to a hospital with life-threatening injuries and later died, police said at the time. Lee had been working as chief product officer for the cryptocurrency company MobileCoin. He previously served as, as chief technology officer, officer of Square. Well, I think we all know Square. Uh, now known as Block, a financial technology company co-founded by Twitter chief Jack Dorsey. That's right. Lee went on to create Cash App, a money transfer service. He was also an investor in Elon Musk's SpaceX venture. I didn't know that. As well as other tech firms such as the social app Clubhouse. Oh, I remember everybody was excited about Clubhouse about a year and a half ago. Uh, he was widely praised by former colleagues, including mobile CEO Joshua Goldbard, who said in a Twitter thread that Lee was a brilliant visionary with a kaleidoscopic mind. Uh, I also heard, I think in the, uh, I heard this report on TV yesterday, and I think there was some suspicion that the two of them had actually been uh I guess to dinner or someplace together, and they had been in a car or in a vehicle of some type together, got into an argument about some business dealings, and 
So there's some speculation that that's why the guy killed him. So nobody's known, but they think it might have came out of an argument that they were arguing over some business deal. And like I say, the uh, suspect has had some shady dealings in the past where he's actually gotten charged with lesser violations. So who knows? Anyway, very, very serious story. Um, Brian says, no one wants to work for Twitter. Yeah, that's probably true. I'm, on the one hand, my mind would say, well, I wouldn't mind working for Elon. But yeah, I'm thinking with working for Twitter, you probably have a lot of chances of ending up with some, a lot of dirt sticking to you when you have nothing to do with it in the first place, is my guess. Um, and Brian says, San Francisco is littered with homeless individuals who are fairly aggressive. Yeah, and that's what everybody assumed, and we were, you know, everybody who assumed it was wrong. Um, on Tucker last night, when he announced the story, he was apologizing like crazy for assuming the same thing that we all assumed, and that makes perfect sense. So it's going to be an interesting thing, but, but I think San Francisco does tend to kind of let criminals, including homeless and whoever, get away with a lot, including, I think, some uh, attempted murders. But this is a case where one of the tech big shots got it. Well, I would think Google, Amazon, they're all going to make sure this gets prosecuted. So... I think that's the big difference in the case, and I think that's the big difference. And I think that's why there's no they're looking for no bail, too, because I would think the guy's an extreme flight risk. So let's go on to the next story, which is very short. Uh, just Google I.O. is coming up on May 10th, and I found this on Android Authority. Here's when Google I.O. 2023 happens with the likely launch of Pixel hardware. This will probably be the start date for Android 14 public betas, too. So into root of view. Okay. And this was uh, from yesterday, I believe. And I don't know who wrote it. But as is tradition, Google today posted a puzzle that, when cracked, would reveal the start of uh, date of I.O., the start date of I.O., its annual developer again. I gather this was the puzzle. I wouldn't figure it out from that, but I'm, I think it's cool that they did. Uh, the code has been cracked, and now we know when things get started. Google I.O. 2023 will start on May 10th. Usually, this is when the keynote address starts. This hours-long introduction to the event almost always features hardware announcements along with new features for existing Google products. Additionally, the launch of the first public betas of Android 14 should happen on or around this date. It's a very big time for Google and Android. That's true. As in years past, I.O. will be streamed for free online so anyone can watch. There will also be in-person attendance, although Google says it, this will be limited. Typically, only developers and press members attend I.O., but registration is open now if you want to try your hand at getting an in-person ticket. You could take a shot. Uh, what to expect? Google usually announces I.O., usually uses I.O. to announce new hardware. In years past, we've seen Pixel smartphones, Chromebooks, and S products, and more. This year, we wouldn't be surprised to see the Google Pixel 7a. Yeah, last year, we got the 6a. We also wouldn't be surprised to see the Pixel tablet, we hope, finally. Uh, it's also possible Google could tease future products, even including the Pixel 8 series. Yeah, because last year, this is when we first heard about the Pixel 7 stuff and the tablet. Uh, we've seen Google do this in the past, such as last year when it announced numerous products at the end of the keynote. You should also expect updates to current products. Google could announce new Android features as well as updates for various hardware already out in the wild. It's almost assured that we'll hear a lot about AI. Yeah, you can count on it, especially Google Bard. 
It's possible Google could even use the keynote to announce the general availability of BARD. That would be nice. However, we won't know much more until we get to the event. So, at least now we know it's May 10th, and of course, we're all going to start building up our excitement. We all do. I always do. And I think most of us, most of us nerds do anyway. So, that's that one. Stop screen. Let's see. Yeah, Brian says, no Pixel Fold that I... Yeah, a few weeks ago, we were all expecting the Pixel Fold, and there was a whole lot of stories and talk about the Pixel Fold, fold is going to come out, and now not a mention of it in this story. So kind of strange. It's like the excitement and the rumors came and went, and now they seem to be gone. So it be interesting to see if anybody brings it up between now and May 10th. Oh, Brian, thank you. As always, sir, you're so very faithful, and you know we'll go towards good tech use, that's for sure. So let me go to my next story. So it's going to be an early night since I'm all by myself. Okay, share screen. Okay, next story. Uh, this is one of those I just thought was interesting. And this is speculation on the uh, author's part, too. Uh, iPhone 8, 8 Plus, and iPhone 10 may have already received their last major software updates. So this was on digital trends. And like I said, this is speculation. So let's go see. Uh, your old iPhone may not get iOS 17 this year. And that's good by Christine Romero Chan. So she thinks it might be a good thing. She's going to explain why. And this was from uh, Monday. So let's read a view. With Apple's Worldwide Developer Conference coming on June 5th, we're expecting a lot of cool things to be announced during the keynote. This could finally be the time that Apple unveils its mixed reality headset and, of course, we'll be getting our usual slate of software updates for existing products. Now, remember last week we had a story where two very dependable leakers were saying the exact opposite. One was saying, uh, Quo, I think, was, was saying that uh, the headset was going to come out, and the other, and German was saying, no, it's not going to come out, or vice versa. But anyway, so I don't think any of us know whether we're going to see this headset at all. But we'll find out. In, in, uh, in June, June 5th. That includes iOS 17, which will no doubt ship with the iPhone 15 later this year. But one rumor going around recently, and this is the first I've heard of this, is that iOS 17 could be dropping support for the iPhone 8, 8 Plus, and iPhone 10. iPad OS 17 may also be leaving the first generation. 9.7-inch uh, and 12.9-inch iPad Pros, as well as the fifth-generation iPad in the, in the dust. Uh, though many people who are using these devices seem to be outraged at the possibility of not getting iOS 17 on their older iPhones. I think it's the right decision. Here's why. I'm sure people are going to fume over her just saying that. You already got over five years of software upgrades, and that's very true. Last uh, fall, you got the fifth software upgrade. Uh, one of Apple's greatest strengths is how long the company continues to support its older devices, especially compared to the competition. Some devices, like the original iPhone SE and iPhone 6S, were able to survive seven years of software upgrades. That's true. More recent devices, however, seem to be capping out somewhere between five to six years of upgrades. Apple also continues to push out security updates for older devices uh, much longer than that, too. In January 2023, Apple pushed out a security update for devices still on iOS 12. And that's very good. While competing flagships from Samsung and Google such as uh, the Galaxy S23, which I have right here, and the Pixel 7 are getting better with long-term support. It's still not as good as Apple. True. Samsung is promising S23 uses four years of software upgrades and five years of security updates. 
Google offers three years of Android upgrades for Pixel 7 devices while providing security updates for four years. So Samsung is still a year better than they are. Keep in mind that Samsung hasn't always provided support for us flagships for this long. Samsung only started doing this in early 2022, but they've gotten to be really good at it. Better late than never, I suppose, and honestly, it's a good start. Uh, the iPhone 8, 8 Plus, and the iPhone 10 were all originally launched in the fall of 2017, so their five years has come and gone with iOS 11. With this in mind, that means these devices have been out for at least five years and have thus far received five software updates to iOS 16. That's already more than what Samsung and Google offer with their flagship. That's true. And I think it's been a really good run. The iOS, and here's another one of her pretty good points. The iOS experience isn't the best on older phones. While Apple does support older devices longer than the competition, you still aren't getting the most optimal user experience on said devices. Due to older processors and hardware, some of the newer features that Apple shows off during the keynotes aren't available for the oldest models that it can be installed in. Yes, sometimes it's just not worth investing the money to have people program that far back. Uh, for example, one of the big features that Apple showed off for iOS 16 was the ability to lift objects and people from an image and paste them elsewhere. That was pretty cool. Essentially turning them into stickers. But for this feature to work, the iPhone needs to have an A12 Bionic chip or later, which those do not, uh, which is the iPhone X uh, 10s and up. Even some accessibility features like the new de dictation feature that punctuates as you speak or live captions, which adds captions to live content like video calls require the A12 or later. Good point. Even if Apple weren't going to cut off the iPhone 8, 8 Plus and iPhone 10, you'd likely be missing out on even more features, which just leads to an overall poor experience. Of course, you're still using an older device, and it's been working out fine for you, then that's great. Oh, of course, if you're still using it. Uh, you probably don't care about the new features, or they're just trivial to you and don't affect how you use your device. That's yeah, going to be true for a lot of people. We did put iOS 16 on an old iPhone 8, and it wasn't as bad as we were expecting. It didn't run slower than iOS 15, and battery life didn't feel like it took a hit. Okay, so they've already successfully done it. But if you like to have newer features and functionality to play with, then that will certainly be hampered by having an older device that will be six years old by then. And sometimes these new features are actually very useful for accessibility for people who need them, such as the live caption feature. It's been a good run, but it's time to move on. In the end, Apple continues to have the longest support for older devices compared to its competition, and that's great. It lets people get more use out of their devices, which are quite expensive. But at some point, those devices just won't get the major iOS upgrades anymore, and that's fine. Apple still uh, will put out security updates and patches when needed, and they'll continue to work. You just won't have the new software versions. With that context, it's a bit silly why people are raging that iOS 17 could drop support for the 8, 8 Plus, and iPhone 10. After all, five to six years of supported upgrades is still way better than what you'd get on the Android side of things. That's very true. All good things must come to an end at some point, whether you like it or not. So she writes a good article. I think she makes some very good points. And yeah, I don't think anybody complained about the longevity of the upgrades. So. Okay, let's see if we got any comments. Um, hey, Annette, glad you dropped by. Always very, very happy to have you here. And let's see, Brian said, iOS really adds any new cool features. Well, they did uh, last year, you know, 
let's see. Um, they don't even add night mode for their older devices where third-party apps can do it. That is very true. Uh, and he said they can add portrait mode also to single lens cameras. Yeah, but you know, Apple, I, Apple doesn't want to spend the money on developers doing these things for these older devices. That's my guess. And I think I would feel the same way. I think, I'm not sure. Am I as greedy as Apple? Well, I'm not in their position. I don't know. <laughs> I guess I could be. I don't know. All right. We've got one more story left. So let me go share screen again. I just thought this was just an interesting story. This was on um, Android Central. Is the Note 7 still affecting Samsung's charging decisions? Well, let's see. The Galaxy Note 7 is still haunting Samsung, and they really need to get over it. This is by Nick Sutrick, who's usually on their um, podcast. Now, Samsung still lags behind in charging speed, but why? So let's go into review. And this was from uh, yesterday. Every year, it seems like a smartphone charge. It seems like smartphone charging speeds get faster and faster as battery sizes ramped up from a thousand milliamp, which was very common ten years ago, to a norm of five thousand milliamp for phones like the Galaxy S23 Ultra. It made sense that charging speed would need to increase, so it didn't take half a day to charge your phone. So why is Samsung still so far behind the pack when it comes when it seems to lead in so many other areas? Even the best USB chargers will still still take over an hour and a half to charge your Galaxy S23 Ultra battery from empty to full, while most Chinese phone brands advertise a maximum of 20 minutes for a full charge. Last year, my colleague Harish. Uh, wrote about this very topic. Yeah, Harish is a very good writer, and he's always in very in-depth. Essentially saying it's okay because Samsung's batteries last longer than the competition. But the evidence here isn't conclusive. And even the American Bar Association, yes, the same group that certifies lawyers that could sue a big phone manufacturer for selling faulty products or lying in marketing claims, says that fast charging is only a big deal if it generates a lot of heat. Even Motorola is using over 100 watt charging. That I didn't know. These days, while Samsung users are still stuck at a real max of 25 watts, and that's true. Uh, I've got the 45 watt charger, and it doesn't seem to do any better than a 25 watt charger. Yes, some, saying some phones offer 45 watt charging, but real world performance isn't actually any better than 25 watt charging on the same phone. That's true. Of course, I'm sure most of us have tried both 25s and 45. It takes the same amount, either one. Uh, Samsung went to its shell in regard to battery light, battery tech after the Note 7. After the Note 7. Problem is that they forgot to come out again when all was safe. This week, we saw a report from Phone Arena proving that Samsung's wireless charging speed has gotten slower over the past year instead of faster. Wireless charging is known for getting phones hot when the wire is too high. That's true. So it makes sense for Samsung to be shy about ramping up wireless charging wattage too much. This wouldn't be such an issue for users if wired charging improved. Yeah, good point. Alas, wired charging on Samsung phone is still relatively slow. What's particularly odd about this little glitch in the matrix is that the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 chipset that powers the Galaxy S23 series runs a lot cooler than the processors that power the S22 series. That's true. So why would this be the time that Samsung goes backward? Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that, and it's not likely that Samsung will be particularly forthcoming with that sort of information either. Uh, without Samsung directly admitting it, I think the real reason we don't have faster charging on Samsung phones goes right back to a major incident that happened seven years ago. When the Galaxy Note 7 got recalled over design flaws that caused the battery to swell and potentially catch fire, 
Samsung understandably went back into its proverbial shell for battery tech. The problem, of course, is that it forgot to come back when things became safe again. Heck, Samsung completely killed off the Galaxy Note name because of all this and replaced it with the Galaxy S Ultra series. Even the tablets don't have the name Note in them anymore. Wireless charging can make a phone hot, but the S23's processor runs a lot cooler than the S22's processor, so why is charging slower on the new model? Uh, but I do know one thing for sure. If Samsung wants to keep up with the Joneses and continue to claim that its phones are the best, it needs to seriously consider how slow charging speeds are making the company look. Taking two and a half hours to wirelessly charge is hilariously bad, especially in 2023. The Galaxy Note incident was terrible, and no one wants to relive those days, especially not Samsung. But those lessons have been learned. Countless other companies uh, have proven that ultra-fast charging is safe, effective, and just plain awesome. Samsung, let the ghost of the past die. It's time to move on. So very well written article and very well stated. And maybe that'll put a little uh, impetus into Samsung and give us some faster charging. So just thought that was a good article. So I'm going to finish up as I do every week with the glowing rectangles, just in case you're new here and you don't know about going, glowing rectangles. If you go on to, let's see if I can get some of my branding stuff out of the way. If you go on to reddit.com forward slash r forward slash forward slash glowing rectangles, you come to glowing rectangles and you can get exposure for any article or video that you or anybody else that you want to put there. Uh, you can put it right there on uh, any day. And if you click top, you get to, you can upvote and downvote. If you click top, you'll see what got the most votes today. Uh, and this was his Intel Science deal to make ARM chips. I saw that article. He comes out with a new vlog every Friday. And he's uh, pretty interesting to follow. I subscribe to him. Uh, Vivo Band in Germany, Gaming Phone Madness, The Friday Checkout. Yes, the name, name of his, his vlog, The Friday Checkout. Uh, so that got four upvotes today. Uh, Roki Max AR glasses. Yeah, no. One back now. This is one back now. Some gadget guy. He's the one that made this and keeps it up to date so you can thank him for any exposure that you or anybody else you want is getting. So he put the Rokid Max AR glasses today, a major upgrade for your face. I should watch this because I watched this last one a couple few weeks ago and I'm guessing this is probably going to make AR glasses better. I'm thinking I'm going to end up getting AR glasses at some point. I'm getting pretty interested in them. Here's another one that got three upvotes. So just showing that you can upvote. You can downvote, too. I just don't know anybody who does or why they would. So these are some of the stories that were put on uh, going rectangles today. And here's our story, which we're in the middle of right now. But uh, Ted set this up so it automatically loads in there. So even though we haven't finished the broadcast yet, it's already out there. So I'll give, give myself an upvote. So there. So just want to tell you about glowing rectangles every week, folks. As I said, reddit.com forward slash r forward slash glowing rectangles. So let's go out of that. Let's stop screen. And let me put my stuff back and back to the comments. Uh, Brian says Samsung afraid of the exploding but yeah that was the whole point and but the slowest charging devices are still pixels and iPhones 
what bothers me even more about the Pixels that and Pixels are by far the slowest upgrading devices too. Uh, hey, big house, glad you're here, brother. You got here just before I'm going to end it because nobody came on with me tonight. So of course it was a show. Oh, thank you. Very pleased, DSP. Thank you for the nice comment. The big house. Okay, yeah, Brian was here very early, like an hour, more than an hour before I even started. So very, very faithful. So that's it for tonight, folks. That's Friday Night Tech Talk. Um, maybe next week uh, Ted will come back in if he has a chance. Or who knows, by some miracle, we might even get Will. Uh, according to Mike, he thought he might get back with us sometime next month. So I guess we're still a couple of weeks from seeing his face again. But hopefully he'll be back sometime soon. So I hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please give us a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and tell your friends and family about if you think they might be interested in any of these tech stories that I give you every week. And as I said, uh, if you're new here, I do uh, two or three other uh, uploads during the week, most weeks. And of course, if you follow me on Amazon, yeah, Amazon, <laughs> if you follow me on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, I post a lot of stuff there. I post a heck of a lot of pictures. And I post a lot of pictures and results of my exercise, which I exercise at least four days a week, sometimes five. So you can follow me there and keep up with everything that I do. So as always, I want to wish everybody a very, very blessed weekend, productive, if that's what you're into, like me. And uh, let's always remember we all do better when we love each other. So see you next week, folks.